And I think also CX's journey, Matt, um, and it's constantly evolving. You know, it's constantly improving. So that links back then to culture. Hi, I'm Matt Eagle, the host of the CX and Culture Connection, the podcast for CX leaders who are looking to drive ROI from their investments in customer experience and culture together. I'm excited to be joined by uh, Ken Coyne today, who's the head of CX at Ops Talent. Thanks for joining, Ken. No, Matt, thank you. And thank you for having me on your podcast. Very excited about talking about CX and hopefully EX also today. Something I'm passionate about myself. Yeah, this is an area that we both share a lot of excitement for, and I've always enjoyed talking, talking with you. Um, I guess just to kick it off, um, uh, you're very active in the call center space and have been an innovator in that area. Uh, would love to get your thoughts on kind of the evolution of call centers, in particular, the, the role they play and how they've shifted a bit from a cost center to more of a re revenue generator and actually being a key part of the customer experience. Could, could you kind of share your thoughts on how the space has evolved? Yeah, great, great question, Matt. No problem at all. Um, first of all, Ops Talent is the name of our company. Uh, we're a BPO based out of Poland and Sri Lanka. Uh, and as you say, we've seen a massive evolution over the years in the contact center space. I mean, in the past, the contact, uh, contact center really was just about taking phone calls uh, and basic queries, you know, reset my password, where's my package, um, just simple information. And it was large volume, a lot of people. Um, and traditionally, a lot of problems with turnover of staff in that area because people didn't want to do these jobs, you know. Uh, and as you say, it was seen as a cost center, not as a big value add as what is seen today in the whole customer experience space. Shift, you know, 15, 20 years now in advance, and here we are, we're seeing contact centers as being the key differentiator in the business, customer service, customer experience. Uh, you look at technology today, Matt. Technology, amazing. It's evolving very, very quickly, but a lot of companies can't keep up with it. And and how do you differentiate yourself in the competition in the space? Because take, for example, ChatGDP that came out, you know, what is 13 months ago? How many competitors in the space in the last six months? It's incredible. So how do you differentiate yourself? And that's where the key, where contacts are comes, contact, contact centers come into space. It's about the people. People managing those calls. It's a technology that comes into that space. So when you invest in people, and that's what we've spoken about in the past, the whole employee experiences, is that you're differentiating your product offering. You're providing an amazing customer experience that, you know, that that clients want to work with you. They want to continue to work with you, even though they know there's a competitive product about there. Maybe it might be even cheaper but they would choose you because of the whole customer experience that goes with that. Um, and today we're seeing now, I mean, it's amazing as well in terms of cost reduction. Um, like you mentioned there about the cost centers piece, cost savings are incredible now because con contact centers now are not just providing people anymore, it's providing solutions. And what type of solutions are there? There are things like automation. How can we reduce the number of people that we have? How can we reduce the number of calls that we're getting on a daily basis? How do we handle these calls? Now there's multiple channels out there. There's bots, you know, there's email, um, there's chat, um, text messages. How do you keep up with all this? And this is where the contact center comes into space and says, okay, we can help you deliver all these channels. We can help you manage these channels. We can help you automate because um, we have bots. We work with partners, for example, uh, and we can help you with things like self-service. So we're actually adding to that whole customer experience space and making the, the whole process seamless, reducing those call volumes, reducing those costs. And then what's happening as a result is that it's all about customer experience now. It's providing specialized teams that can go above and beyond and deliver that great experience. And what happens when you have you know, great teams like that is that those teams are actually upselling. They're reducing customer churn. Um, they're adding more products. Um, and they're providing more value back to the business. And also, I mean, the key to these new companies now, especially in the tech space, is having a product roadmap, introducing new products, new features all the time. These guys, they're on the ground, listening on a day-to-day -day basis, listening to the frustrations that you know the clients are having, listening to feedback and saying, well, have you thought about adding this feature or this idea? And what's happening now is that we have in my, very much a 360 degree feedback is that you go and talk to these people on the ground. What are you hearing? What are the challenges out there? What are the problems out there? And they're actually helping building out the roadmap for the product offering. 
So working very closely with technology, becoming a key center in the organization to build out also the new technology, the new features for into the future. There's such a wealth of insights in what you just shared, Ken. I'd like to kind of unpack a few of them in turn and, and dive in. I know we'll have a really rich conversation. One of the things that really resonated with me when you just said is that the call centers are a source of insights. Yes. And I think this is true for a lot of businesses. In fact, a lot of people say, walk in your customer's shoes. Look what Zappos did where they made the executives man the phones. You know, they rotate people through... Um, the call center because they, they get the pulse of the customers. They get to really feel what the issues are for the customers. A lot of businesses do this where they have their management trainees now, you know, walk in the shoes of their customers or directly interact with their customers. Go visit your customers, do, do customer visits, do you know, man the call centers because it gives you insights. And then the, the question then is how do you jet drive this more regularly? I think one of the things that's really interesting now is how you can listen to the call centers as a source of insights and also empower your people to share ideas. In the past, we didn't really have, you know, someone at the, at the board table that was managing CX as an organization. Now it's come very popular that you do have a board member who's the head of CX in the organization working across that organization. And like you say, one of the key parts of their job is providing that feedback, providing that experience. And actually it's not only even just audio, video now is becoming very popular where you're actually getting video feedback. That's another channel where, you know, you can really see the frustration on people's faces, the challenge is much more powerful on video than it is on listening to a phone call. But more and more management, and these are the companies that are getting it right, they're sitting there for, you know, they might take a day out in a month and sit there with these and listen to the phone calls and listen to the feedback and see firsthand what type of experiences they're getting and how can they improve and address that and really just understand what is, what's happening on the ground. And then, as you say, there's some great tools out there now that you can monitor automated tools that are tracking, you know, sentiment on the call. What is the sentiment of that person? How frustrated they are? And that not only helps understand what are the challenges, but also helps you to build better agents, improve, develop train those agents to help them deal with these, these type of calls and track that data. There's so much opportunity here, and I feel like we're getting closer and closer to a more integrated, holistic approach to managing this, but a lot of things are still done in silos or very manual processes where we can summarize the calls, we can develop tracking you know, trends and insights, but we're getting closer now to a more automated, simple approach where you listen to the calls you, you, you know what the um, what a good call looks like. Do you want to make sure your people are knowledgeable, make sure you deliver the right expertise, make sure you're courteous, you're reliable, you're friendly, et cetera. Well, you can pick the things you want to listen for. What does a good call look like? And then you can also identify the behaviors that you want of people in the call. And the missing step for most companies is to be systematic in driving behavior adoption linked to their listening efforts so that you listen, then you train and you drive behavior change, and then you listen to see whether the behaviors are showing up. Otherwise, what you end up with is a very reactive approach to people training people based on when they think they didn't do well in the call. Yeah, very interesting point. But I think also that links back to, which is what your book is about, is about the employee experience and culture. And that's key to that success. Yes, I always say technology, I mean, it is fantastic and it is an enabler, but it's the people that make it happen. Um, and that CX has to be driven by the employee experience, by the values of the organization. What values does that organization have? And everything has to revolve around that. And like you mentioned there, behavioral skill sets, training, development. When you have great culture, I mean, like for us, it's all about being happy, be helpful, be humble, be honest, be healthy. They're, they're what we live off and everything revolves around that. And when people buy into that and that's getting that feedback from people and they really enjoy it, they become passionate, they go above and beyond and they just create that experience on the call. So yes, technology is great for that, but you also have to have the culture behind that. Absolutely. And that's, that's why the podcast is called The CX and Culture Connection and why my book is called The CX and Culture <laughs> Connection. It's no coincidence that they both have the same name and we both share those interests that um, I've always really loved uh, working in industries with lots of frontline employees like retail and hotels and healthcare and financial services because you can really 
drive um, this connection of CX and culture where you get the right behaviors, you get the right energy flowing in the organization, and then the experiences your people deliver actually reinforce your brand. They reinforce the, the company's growth and you get a flywheel. Um, and the call centers is often one of the most valuable places to start to catalyze this cultural movement because you have a lot of good data um, and you have um, a really tangible way to drive behavior activation. You can extend that to your frontline people who are salespeople. To your point, now that a lot more of the sales calls and interactions are visible with you know video that is also a source of data, you can apply the same principles from the call centers into a broader set of frontline interactions for behavior adoption. Yeah, interesting. And you know, on top of that as well, Matt, is that it's, you know you mentioned sales there. More, we're seeing that more and more common now that um, the clients we work with are looking for to really do sales training to the customers that support team. Because they're not just taking base inquiries anymore. That's technology is managing that. Um, it's how can you help us, you know, upsell our product? How can we cross sell it, offer more opportunities? And what other products do we need to be putting out there? You know, and you're getting that feedback as well. That's become a key, key requirement. Well, this is um, a huge opportunity in a few ways. One is um, with e-commerce, there are now a lot, a lot of businesses that can take locations. You see this in some retailers where they're able to extend their reach beyond where they have physical stores because they have call centers and they have e-commerce and they have chat so they can scale a business beyond where they have a physical pr footprint. Um, you know, a great example of this is B and H photo where they've got a store in New York, but they're, they've got hundreds of people in the call center and they can actually extend nationally and they do really, really well with, um, uh, you know, getting people to engage with their content and their people, but they don't have lots of stores. They're an e-commerce business. Um, so e-commerce creates an opportunity for businesses to expand, um, you know, for small businesses to become big businesses. Um, and also what you see is businesses that, um, you know, uh, rely on a connection with people like, you know, in healthcare, for example, the connection with the nurses or the connection with the practitioners, you now see people using live chat and other vehicles to bring expertise to people um, in a way of, you know, driving wellness programs and driving adoption of, uh, in pharmaceuticals and things like that, that, you know, the connection with people. So live chat is actually a way to bring the experience to them that used to rely on a hospital visit for people to interact with somebody. Yeah. And, you know, and, and that's a good point. And you need to have these types of channels. Because the world we live in today now is that people don't want to be pick up the phone anymore unless they got a real, real problem. They want to have, like you mentioned, live chat, and I use it myself all the time. I find it fantastic. Or they want to use a text or a bot, or they want to, you know, it should be a, it's such a seamless experience that they can go in and find the answer for themselves on the platform or that piece of technology or on the website. Um, and you'll find that we find now that call centers, so to speak, is less and less about phone calls. Um, it's very much about that whole, the whole experience together, seamless experience. What are some of the tangible ways that companies can re reinforce this connection between employee experience, customer experience, and culture? Great question, Matt. Um, well, first of all, at the end of the day, your CX is only as good as your EX. I mean, at the end of the day, when you've got happy employees, you're going to have happy customers. That's the, that's the reality because when you treat your employees well, they will treat your customers accordingly. And that goes back to shared values and beliefs. What are the values of your organization? Is everyone living those values each and every day? Are they authentic values? It can't be something that you sit around the board table and say, okay, these are the values of the company guys and put up on the wall. Everyone has to live that and has, has, has to come from the leadership down. They have to deliver on those values and they have to report on those values. All the feedback of the organization has to be on those values. Um, and the employee experience is the foundations. You know, like I mentioned there a moment ago, if you have a positive employee experience where you've got people are developed and, you know, they're trained, that will translate into happy, engaged employees. And when, as you know, when, when employees are engaged, they go above and beyond creating that amazing experience for the client. And, you know, we found as well in our experience with that is that when you really empower employees and look after and create that in a great environment for them, the ideas that they come up with is just amazing. Absolutely phenomenal. I mean, there's so much initiatives that we got going in the organization now. I couldn't keep track of them. Um, like, for example, like that we've got, a, you know, we have KPIs. 
measure employee success. And this is one key point here is that where companies get it wrong because they have these KPIs. They're trying to micromanage employees based on these KPIs. They give them documentation to work off and this is the script and you have to stick to the script. That doesn't work in the world we live in today. What we have uh, is keep people in, in motivated. That's what we keep, keep people inspired. That's our KPI actually. That's what we work on. How do we keep our people inspired? And we invest everything around that, you know, and that's about providing training, development that goes with that. Because when you have that inspiration, people again will go above and beyond that. And it's about accountability in CX. You know, not everybody has to be accountable for their actions. And that links back to the values as well that goes with that and the culture piece. You know, if you make a mistake, everyone should be able to own up and say I made a mistake and that's that's okay. We you know we learn from it, we move on. And that goes from the leader is down to the very you know bottom that goes with that. And it's about being humble and being honest and giving that feedback. And it has to be honest feedback when you're giving feedback on that culture that what you work with. Um, and things like, like you know, empowering lessons learned. I would have said, you know, um, open communication as well as key. You know, building that trust. I was amazed actually. I was at an event, a customer service event in Las Vegas last uh, summertime, and I was looking around at all the new technologies out there. And there was one company, and they had a tool where it's built into your computer where the video would monitor the employee as they're working or as they're in meetings to make sure they're engaged on the meeting. I mean, if I knew, if I was working in an organization like that, I would have no trust in that organization. I mean, we don't, we have enough measurements. We have enough tools out there to measure employees and what they're doing. We don't need to be micromanaging and watching this kind of stuff. What works better is if the measurement and the insight is to look for ways to help and train and inform people and give them data that they can take and act on versus to have gotcha moments. Uh, I mean, yes, it's it's useful to know whether things drove a good outcome and where things were good or bad, but ultimately what you want is energy in the organization where people are motivated, where people know what they need to do, they know the behaviors you want, and they feel empowered and excited to go do it. And if you're going to listen to the call, it's going to be to help give them feedback to do better, not to catch them. And I think also CX is a journey, Matt, um, and it's constantly evolving. You know, it's constantly improving. So that links back then to culture. Because if you're creating a culture of continuous development, a positive organization based on well-being, then then CX will naturally evolve with that. Like, like I mentioned, you'll have new ideas, new initiatives, new technologies have to go and improvements, and that'll just come along with culture. Yeah. If you share with people what the brand stands for, what's the brand promise, and what you want the experience to look like, and you share examples with people over time of what a good experience is, people are proud of the impact they can have. They're proud of delivering a good experience. They want to do well. We crush it out of people in the environments you talked about. So if people know what good looks like, and you're giving them examples, and then um, inspiring them and giving them data and insights about whether they're consistent with what good looks like, they will find ways to do better. They were, they will be proud of doing better. You know, you know what I guess, you know what I love on that point as well. I love to see people develop and go beyond. I mean, I love it in an organization to see people like that would start even customer service. Uh, and now are like the head of the customer service team, or they've moved into HR, PR. And we've actually have an initiative uh, in our in our organization called um, the T program. Uh, it's a training evaluation, and we we our managers are are out to look out for people, exceptional people that you think can go above and beyond a normal agent. They can do improvements. So, for example, like for, we saw someone last year that seemed for a great initiative, great for your outgoing, um, and could be a great value add to the sales team. We ended up moving from out of there into the sales team. Uh, or we had we had people that were designing posters, internal posters in the organization. We saw she had a great eye for design, uh, and we you know she's now a UX UI designer, and she's helping to build out new design. And when other people see that, that empowers them. It also motivates them to say, "Wow, I can achieve this. I can do this." And this, anything is possible based in that organization. And I just love to see that growth. It's fantastic. Yeah. What do you what do you see often as the you know? the business case outcomes that turn these soft issues that we're talking about into hard business benefits? Like what, how do we, what, are, what do you see as the business case outcomes that are, that deliver the value from what we're talking about here? Um, I think the biggest, the biggest business case outcomes, I suppose for us, you know, it's going back to what you've been measured on and, you know, for customer service, for example, a big measurement of that is staff turnover. That's, it's a key measurement. 
And you see these companies that have staff turnover of 50 percent 60 percent 70 percent it's crazy so there's a massive cost that goes into that you know recruiting people training them getting them up to speed clearly you've got problems in the organization when you got staff turnovers at that levels so we can show that when you invest in employee experience like year and year we're less than five percent uh staff turnover you see the value add you can turn that into a monetary value you can show the benefit of what you know the value add is when you really invest in the people this is the value that you're going to get from this but it, it's a hard sell because if you're starting, and you probably, you've seen it more, more times than me, when you go into an organization that have real big cultural problems, it's a long-term you know, turnaround. It's not something that's going to happen overnight. It takes time. Um, and you have to do it step by step, like we spoke about in our podcast, um, talking about that. Um, and that's why it's difficult sometimes to sell. So getting that leadership team to buy into those outcomes and say, guys, okay, it's going to take time. These are the value adds you're going to get. I mean, you're going to get reduced customer churn, for example. Uh, and you've seen it time and time. There's it, a huge amount of studies out there of the value when companies that expect that invest in customer experience and their employees and the value they're getting in terms of profit margins um, compared to the companies that don't. I think it's like it's like an, a, an 80% increase in that number. I'm not, I don't have the top number, but it's something quite substantial and you probably know better than me. But um, And if, if there are the other kind of things. It, there is a massive monetary return. It's retention of staff. It's retention of your client, your, your clients, you know, maintaining the clients. It's increasing your product sell. You know, it's increasing the profitability of the organization and creating just like a happy, positive organization where people enjoy coming to in that environment they work in. So one thing I'll offer to the audience, uh, two two uh, offers to the audience. First is Ken mentioned, uh, I was on his podcast recently. Ken, do you want to share quickly some details about your podcast? a great podcast. I had a lot of fun uh, being on it, but I want to make sure we get that information to the audience as well. Thank you, Matt. Uh, the podcast is called Tech People. It's something I started about four years ago myself uh, because I love to learn and listen to people's experiences and learn from real world experiences. So I went out there to meet leaders in the space, whether tech leaders or leaders very much focused now on CX. What experiences have they got through and how can I learn from those experiences? So I try and publish it weekly. I had a fantastic chat with Matt recently uh, where we spoke about the whole employee experience uh, and the customer experience. And it's about giving back and helping out. And hopefully if you're in that journey, hopefully you can get some takeaways from it and you can learn as you go through your journey. Thank you, Ken. And the other um, offer I'll make is if you're on your journey at your company and you're exploring the opportunities to drive benefit from uh, modernizing your call centers, expanding your listening approach, driving this employee um, uh, engagement uh, in your call centers, Ken and I would be happy to have a conversation with you to explore, you know, what, what are the opportunities there, including the, uh, the BPO play uh, with the, um, uh, the call center operations, which is uh, the strength of Ken's company. So we'd be happy to have a conversation with you together if you'd like to reach out with us on on linkedin um and uh and have a conversation i think it would be time well spent and something we'd enjoy doing yeah definitely i'm always happy to have a chat and even if i don't have that potential solution i'm always happy to refer somebody that can help you out uh, as you say if you do have any challenges especially with you know staff turnover which is a big problem in many organizations today do please reach out to me and happy to share my experience how has the um the shift over the last few years towards more virtual work, which, you know, it seems to be lasting past the pandemic. You know, we've gone back to a hybrid world, uh, some companies staying very fully virtual or more virtual than before. Um, but we seem to be hitting an equilibrium with more of a virtual, uh, uh, digital workplace, hybrid workplace. Um, but also the call center industry evolved to take advantage of that with uh, with more people working this way. So how has the industry evolved and where do you see it landing um, as some of these trends play out? Well, I think it's fantastic because um, it brings in more people as well because it offers more flexibility um, in the space. And I think that's key part as well to the employee experience because people want to work in companies now where they have flexibility. Things like where they can change shifts, 
uh, things like where they're not forced to come into an office on a day because you've got a lot of great people out there for example that maybe moms or dads that are uh, looking after children at home and they have you know certain times during the day or they want to work in the evening times they want that flexible approach which means now that we can hire people like that where we couldn't in the past uh, and it's bringing it's increasing the talent pool um, also things like you know multilingual support which we work in and we've got multiple different languages we offer it helps us now to be able to go to a much broader mindset and a much higher reach in terms of accessing those type of people and also 24 7 support um people that can work out of office hours work in the evenings weekends it gives us a much very better reach in terms of reaching out to that mindset and graphic but of course the challenge with that is you know how do you manage that culture how do you educate them how do you get to feel, make them feel part of that organization uh, and make sure they feel integrated with that and that's something we continue to work on um, and it's, it's interesting because here now in the us i see a lot of uh, this whole you know flexibility in working from home i see a lot of companies are forcing people back into the office now and i would be interested to see how that works out in practice over the coming years because um, from what i've seen people are happier uh, working or having at least having the flexibility but happier working from home and coming into the office maybe one or two days a week and not being forced to come into the, to the office that go given the choice and we give our people a choice we did look at it um, and we felt we given the choice what we do is we encourage so we organize a lot of internal events in the office trying to get people to come to the office we still have a lovely comfortable office space but encourage them to come in training events uh get together events because social aspect is a key as well a part of that culture and it's about being happy well it's just about, about being creating that happy environment that people it's not just all about work it's about having an enjoyable work-life balance and this is what flexibility and working from home helps you to achieve uh, and when you're happy in your life when you're happy at work i mean you're going to have happy employees and happy customers it does have implications for culture that uh, when you shift to more virtual, uh, you have to be more intentional about what you want the culture to be and how to spread it, the right behaviors, um, and also how to make sure people are forming productive networks in the company. Um, when companies have physical locations and move to virtual, it erodes the networking that naturally occurs and or different types of networks form. So you have to be intentional about how you manage and nurture the culture when you're hundred percent virtual or, or 50, 60% virtual um, to make sure culture is about behavior. And a lot of it gets spread in physical environments when people see other people behave, but it happens digitally too. You just have to pay more attention to nurturing it. Yeah, uh, is it, it's a very difficult one, Matt, um, as you know, for companies to manage. It's easier for companies that have started like that from day one. So it's much more difficult for companies that have been quite traditional now and they move to that w way of working. But again, there's so many different initiatives out there that you could do small things that don't have to be big things to try and build that culture and build that environment around teams. Uh, like I had an interview with somebody there last week in the podcast and I said it to someone else as well, you know, where the manager said, okay, everyone take a picture of your, your desk and send it on and we'll just have a little competition. It's a fun thing, but just get to know who that person is behind the actual phone or the, the video. And then they say, okay, who's that now? Someone's got the clean desk, someone's got the messy desk. Oh yeah, that's definitely John. I'm definitely, and it's, it's a fun thing, but just creating that social environment with that. With that. But there's loads of games and issues you can go with that, uh, keeping people informed, seeking feedback as well as key. I think they're that, you know, go out, listen to people. What, you know, are they happy in terms of feedback, in terms of the values of the company? Do they feel valued? Do they feel respected? It all depends on what the values. Are you happy in the organization? Uh, what can we do to improve that? You know, what type of trainings would you like to see uh, that would help us improve the job that you're doing today? And that's fostering and developing. What you're highlighting is behavior adoption. If you identify the behaviors you want, get people to make commitments, and then if you build habits. You, and, and you can be very intentional about the behaviors you want to encourage and getting people to make commitments and then tracking the behaviors. This is actually something that works really well in a call center environment. If you're doing the customer listening and you know what the behaviors are you want, you can actually see whether you're getting them and then you can not only get people to make commitments to, to practice those behaviors, but you can give them feedback on how they're doing against the behavior. So, uh, this is something we can do in a much more automated way with uh, platforms like Actionable and Qualtrics and other platforms to, to combine uh, customer listening and behavior activation at scale in a way that doesn't just require human beings to listen in on the calls and then manually coach people. That's a great benefit of technology we have today. 
yeah, and you save people time in, uh, in summarizing the calls, tracking the coherence with the actions you want, recommending the right training, and then, and then giving people feedback on how they're doing. So this is a whole new area that there's so much more data available than there used to be. And uh, uh, there's a scalable approach you can take not only to lower the call volume, but make the calls better. Yeah, and personalized. That's the key point there. Personalized based on the data that you actually have in your organization. And there's so much more value. And again, it's uh, that leads into an amazing customer experience. So when one of, when people talk a lot about personalization, it naturally leads to a discussion about AI and, and data and how you leverage that. What do you see as some of the you know real emerging things you can do that are the lowest hanging fruit with AI uh, today? Uh, I think while we're starting, I think we're really at the early stages of this. Uh, and I'm, every company wants to learn more about AI and how it can add value to their organization. I think it's starting with the basic, basic tasks, you know, like uh, on the phone calls, you know, helping that agent answer the call, you know, providing the data quickly, being able to assist them with the answers and the calls. So the AI is actually listening to what the call and it can even provide an assistant answer to that call. That's a huge help or provide information on that customer that guides them through that customer, that call journey, which is fantastic value add. Um, then you, what we had now in the past, you had those traditional bots, you know, where you go on and you get the phone call and quite often it was a bad experience. Whereas now you got these self-service uh, AI bots, which are so much far superior and create a great, much better journey that you can go on and have a bot that will answer the question um, and give you real proper answers and you can ask it anything. And that's via directly on the actual system yourself, like real live chat bots, or you can do it on a phone, like an automated bot on the phone. Um, and that again, just makes journey, it gets rid of a lot of those easy, simple questions that people want, don't want to be making phone calls for a two agents who want to be answered. Um, so it cuts down and adds so much value automation in the process. And then what's happening is you're, when you get the actual call, you're dealing with real calls. And then the focus now has been that leads to more, you know, higher experience, first time call resolution, more and more companies are investing more because now they have more to do it. They can invest and leave those agents sit on those calls, you know, for 10, 15 minutes to make sure that customer is happy, they're getting the solution and it's not being, you know, okay, I'm going to take it. Here's your ticket number. I'll come back to you in two or three days. That's not acceptable anymore. Uh, but you have to have that automation in place before you can get that next stage. And that's where the big value and it's a great big win for everyone. Right. So using the AI to answer questions um, before talking to a person uh, and then having a companion to the agent that can help in the background, maybe synthesize and summarize and recommend things, a co-pilot, but exactly. that can help somebody. Uh, and great training as well, because it really trains the agents as well, because as, as I mentioned a while ago, so, staff turnover is high. So insight, insights, summarization, training, and then um, automation, and then in some cases, replacing a portion of the call like we talked about. Exactly. Or, or, or entire calls. Exactly. Many applications of AI. Oh, it's incredible. I and mean, it's very exciting to watch, see what's yeah. going, how it's going to evolve for the future. And one of the great things about working with a company like Ops Talent is that you not only do you understand the operations of outsourcing the call center and hiring and, and managing, engaging, and you, but you're on the cutting edge of the, applying the technology. So you help the companies get the benefits of this through working with a partner. Yeah, thanks, Matt, for highlighting that. Yeah, I mean, there's two sides of the business. One side, we're doing the contact center and the other side, we're doing the technology. So we're helping our, 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 our customers implement the AI tools that they can improve the whole experience and having the technology and the customer side and working across different organizations, different verticals, we're, we're getting a great value add. Where do you see things going? You know, where, how do you think the um, customer experience is going to evolve in the future? Well, as we, as I mentioned earlier, it's constantly evolving. There's no doubt about it. Um, and it's, you know, how to improve those customer experiences. I see all those basic queries will be gone and uh, they're just going to be wiped from what we had in the past. I see now, and I, I'm talking to clients, they're looking for CX specialized teams going forward into the future that are handling those calls that are experts in their space and their domain um, that they will spend whatever time it takes to resolve those issues. I see the customer service agent as not just being uh, you know, a normal agent anymore. They're, they're becoming experts and they're like sales experts. They're becoming brand ambassadors for the organization. They're coming key to the success of the organization because they're feeding back to the IT team, like I mentioned to start for a call. They're feeding back to senior management, getting the feedback from the actual clients. What are the frustrations? What are the issues? Because in the end of the day, the product is based now on 
in, in feedback and that's your client feedback what are they looking for what are they willing, what are they willing to spend on and it's your front line of the of, the, of support these are the guys that are coming to key differentiators but technology is the enabler and that um and i definitely see more and more technology to improve that experience data obviously being the new gold out there is analyzing that data and how can we move value how can we add new products new offerings how can we improve that customer experience and this is where we're coming with AI and the tools that go with that. Uh, and also things like, you know, go back to like multilingual support. Very difficult in the past because you need German speakers, French speakers, Japanese speakers. Now with the tools we have out there, you can actually automate that also. Um, which there's some fantastic translation tools out there now that helps uh, in, you know, delivering that experience. So you don't need necessarily to have that automated, uh, that person that speaks French only or German. Only, only for like still specialized CX teams. You know, one thing I've seen in my experience, kind of having started in retail and consumer markets and travel and hospitality, and then expanding to other industries like healthcare and financial services and B2B over time, you know, leveraging some of the learnings in, in some industries to other industries is how much in common and much you can learn across industries. Certainly there are some unique aspects of every industry, but there's a lot of kind of diffusion of innovation and applying best practices across industries. Um, where do you see the innovation happening most now? And where do you see it spreading? Like, you know, you know, uh, in terms of, you know, other markets like healthcare, or financial services, where, where's it starting? Where's it traveling to? And, and, you know, what does that suggest in terms of how leaders of CX should be engaging and opening their eyes to a broader view than just their own industry? You know, it's a great point you make. And I would even go one step further on that. I think it's driven by geographical location as well. Because there are certain countries in the world that are driving technology. I mean, take for example, Amazon. I mean, incredible, that whole experience they have tied down now based on data, providing that amazing service offering on buying goods and services. And it's very difficult to compete with something like that. But then if you look at the FinTech space, I think FinTech is far more advanced in Europe than it is in the US, for example. And there's so much you can learn from that and we're working across both articles, um, like, like the likes of things like neobanks, like the revolutes of the world. I mean, it's fantastic customer experience where you can just generate it. Your, if you lose your credit card or it gets lost, you can generate that credit card immediately, brand new in your phone in two seconds. Um, you don't need to wait for a new card to come. Um, you know, you're dealing directly with an agent, directly on the application. Any questions, any issues you have, it's been direct very, you know, conveniently with that um, and I see that there's no things with checks anymore it's all about that experience that goes with that so I find that fintechs we've done a lot of work in the fintech space definitely are driving a lot of this innovation and going forward into industries I think industries that are really traditional industries like banking insurance pharma they're the industries now that are trying to catch up and trying to get up to speed with the latest innovation um, and it's interesting like they're very old school in terms of contact centers and customer support and even the banking is like checks and these kind of things so i think learning from not only across the industries but also what they're doing in different continents um, i think you can learn an awful lot from can it's been um really exciting uh chatting with you uh, what can um people who want to learn more or get connected, where do you suggest they go to learn more about you and your company and, and what's the best way for them to get in touch with you? Thanks, Matt. And thank you for your time today. Really, really, really enjoyed the chat, firstly. Uh, the best way, I'm, I'm on LinkedIn. I'm very active on LinkedIn. As I say, I publish my podcast on LinkedIn every week. Feel free to reach out to me. I'm always happy to share my experiences. Uh, don't worry, I won't be selling you anything. Uh, but if you need any advice or any help or any assistance in my network, do reach out to me. I'm happy to have a chat with you. Thank you, Ken. It's, um, you sparked some great ideas for me, and I know you have from the audience as well. Thank you, Matt. Absolute pleasure.